is viewer discretion is advised. Very good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us once again on our Sunrise Safari. And as you can see, we've got a beautiful herd of Impala here, just on this open clearing, just south of our camp. And it is a little bit of a brisky morning, but uh, it's fine. Well, I'm sure we are going to survive, but I'm looking forward to a, an amazing safari here at the Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Sabi Sand, South Africa. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera, welcome back to BK. BK is back with us, of course, and I'm looking forward having him behind the camera, and I'm sure we're going to have some great sightings for the morning. But I think maybe this morning, we are sitting at the open, open clearing, just enjoying these impalas, just browsing around here and feeding along this uh, clearing. But uh, from here, I'm going to go head down towards maybe like Treehouse Dam, go take a look, maybe see what's happening at the Hyena Den, see if old June and the Cub might be around that side. And uh, yeah, from there on, yeah, we're not, not too sure. We'll take a look. And I'm looking for rosettes this morning. That's one thing. Rosettes is going to be very important because I haven't had a leopard for the last five days. So I'm... Um, definitely looking for a leopard this morning but yes joining us on the drive this morning on wendy it's going to be in and owen of course then prydens chris and panda all the way in the northwest Madik, where we've got lauren and darby as you can see it is a live and interactive show so if anybody's got questions comments or any suggestions that you want to send through to us and you are watching on the wild earth website make sure that you do register with us so you can send those things through or if you are watching on the YouTube channel, just click on the subscribe button and you'll get all the latest Wild Earth content. But yes, it's beautiful. It's not as cold as yesterday morning. Yesterday morning was a little bit ch chillier, but uh, this morning is actually beautiful. It's, it's a little bit fresh, but it's not a single cloud in the sky. And as I say, we are just watching this beautiful herd of impala just browsing along here. Pamela, yes, uh, I think it's going to be a great safari. I've got that feeling. Um, last night we had, of course, those in Bali um, uh, lions. That's a, a pride of lions that was down towards uh, Chilapan. And uh, yeah, well, yesterday afternoon was a fantastic drive. And once again, I think this morning, we are going to see and find some more amazing stuff. But for now, we're just going to enjoy these impalas. It looks like they're all very much relaxed here. There's not much movement happening. There's not uh, any alarm calling. Sometimes it's always nice just to sit here and watch them, if, just to see if there is any situation or behavior that you know that it's going to alert you to a predator. But now, nothing much, just a beautiful, serene setting for this morning. But yeah, you know, as we're going to sit here, just to kind of listen out and enjoy this moment, let's look at the weather all over today. looking to be a nice sunny day with the sun about to rise here at Eco Training Pridelands Conservancy. And I have a beautiful, beautiful sunrise. I'm just standing here with a nice cup of coffee. My name is Chris Erasmus. With me on camera is Panda Glitz. 
Now, our plan this morning after this sunrise, we're going to head to the far northern reaches of Pridelands. We're going to be checking our northern boundary if there was any cat that entered Pridelands from the north. And we'll reassess from there as to what we're going to do. It is rather chilly this morning. Uh, winter is definitely here in full force. It's not freezingly cold there, but it is definitely, definitely winter here. Remember, we have very mild winters up here in the bush in this spot with the odd cold, the really, really cold days. Especially this time where you literally wait for the sun to rise. That moment, that moment the first rays sort of casts. That particular moment is the coldest of the morning. I think our timing is perfect. We really have that beautiful glow. We've got a nice nopathon tree in the foreground. And a good morning to Angela. Just saying good morning to everybody and hoping for some elephants. Well, Angela, currently there are an incredible amount of elephants around on Brightland. So even though I did say we are going to try and see if there's any lion tracks, we are almost certainly going to find some elephants somewhere. We'll definitely, definitely keep that in mind. I, for one, always have time to stop for elephants, as it is also my favorite animal out in the bush especially with regards to the larger animals. And there are a lot around on Pridelands currently. But for now, we're just gonna wake up with all the birds. And just appreciate this rising sun. It should show its face in the next minute or two. Sandy, good morning. Also just mentioning a, this beautiful sunrise and Sandy also wants to know if there are any predators that would be up and about at this time. Sandy, yes indeed, they will very likely be active. Uh, probably still active from the late morning uh, hours just before sunrise and just after sunrise. And that will go for both leopard and lion. And that is why we refer to them as being crepuscular animals, which is animals that are both nocturnal and diurnal, but with the emphasis on movement being the hours before and after sunrise and sunset. Weather depending, again, in summer it does change. But they do become a lot more nocturnal due to the temperatures. But that is what I'm actually hoping is going to unfold. So as soon as we are finished with our lovely sunrise, that is exactly what I'm going to try and do, is to utilize this crunch time, this first hour of the sunrise, to hopefully find fresh either lion or leopard footprints, tracks or sign, and hopefully be able to follow it. Good morning to Cookster. It's also just uh, saying it's nice to to have me back here for our morning intros, sunrise intros. Thanks so much, Cookster. We've got a few of them ahead, and we have the sun's going to come up now. It's coming. Talking about that, and we don't have that lingering sort of like. Oh, look at that! Here he goes. There's that moment. And you see that first raise. You can, it's almost like there's an initial, just, just a two degree temperature drop. And then it starts heating up. Typical, typical weather for this time of the year. And yes, we have not heard any activity last night. Uh, I did not hear any lions vocalizing during the night, nor leopards. Um, 
there was a few elephants around camp as well as one or two old buffalo bulls but I suspect the most known movements of the Ngati Pride for instance our resident Pride Alliance uh, was to the north of Brightland so that's what we're gonna do we are going to be heading straight towards the far northern reaches and then we will drive the entire northern boundary road slowly to check for any incoming tracks Are you sick of being sick, tired of being tired, mad at menopause, want to lose weight, exercise at your best? Genetic testing can help you. Now you can access your body's unique genetic code. Instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, you can use 3x4's insights to tailor personalized health decisions. 3x4 examines genes that influence weight, hormones, cognition, fitness, and more. You get insights into three specific areas. Start now, connect with yourself, and be empowered to make the best personal decisions. Morning everybody, what a lovely start. This is, look at those beautiful views of the Drakensberg Mountains out in the distance. Look at that lovely soft orange light. It is going to be a good morning indeed. Well, my name is Ben. On camera I have got Odie this morning. It is quite chilly in Juma and I was going to complain about the cold and then realise that I've been in a lot worse and then thought, well, Medikwe will be out at some point and it's going to be very cold up there. So my sympathies to Lauren. But no, we're just stopping to enjoy the view here we have had some quite fresh female leopard tracks coming in from our western boundary coming into Juma from the uh, from the west coming east maybe Shadulu is back uh, we're in the process of just checking out what might be happening so she looks as if she walked down uh, Impala Drive on our western side of the property so we're on her tracks at the moment or had her tracks briefly at least but it's quite difficult substrate here after the uh, the rain a couple of days ago it just sort of compressed all the soil so we need to drive the roads a few times just break it up and then it'll be a lot easier to pick up the tracks in the softer sand but a female leopard definitely went this way so we'll see what we can find we also did have some male leopard tracks on the access road but only for like a hundred meters if that and then i'm not really sure where they went um I don't think they came this way, that's about as much as I can tell you so far, but Cedric and I were 
chatting this morning, as I'm sure he's pointed out. We're both having a bit of a leopard slump at the moment. Uh, I've been back for, yes, female leopard track still on the road here. Uh, I've been back for four or five days and I've seen two leopards, one of which was a very brief sighting and that's been it. And I don't think Cedric's had one for four or five days. So we are both looking for spots this morning. But as always, we'll be quite happy to take anything that we find. It would be a nice change to find a leopard in the road. Uh, whilst we're actually looking for them, I suppose to just randomly bump into them. But let's see. Uh, Juliana, as a rule, I would say sunrise and sunset is the peaks, peak season, as it were. Peak time moving around, but they do move around during the night time as well, obviously, throughout the evening. Um, less active during the day, but you never know. I've seen leopards moving around during the day many, many, many times, even in the middle of summer when it's 40-something degrees outside. So never say never. If it's one thing a leopard is, it's adaptable. And particularly if it feels it's getting a lot of pressure from other predators in the area. If there's a lot of lions around or a lot of hyena activity, then they may become slightly more diurnal in their movements just to avoid bumping into something else but as a rule best time to start looking for them late afternoon and a very good chance of finding one early morning but we often find tracks on top of our tracks when we're coming back at sort of nine o'clock ten o'clock in the morning and we find tracks on top of places that we've driven recently uh, so they do move around during the day but they are laughing at us at the moment and we need to end this leopard drought. I've had a brief look at those tracks. From what I remember from Shadulu's tracks, and Shadulu is the female leopard that I saw on Friday evening. Beautiful girl, and we know she's got a six-ish month old cub. I'm not quite sure how old he is at the moment, uh, whom we still haven't seen. But she spends most of her time in the West um, and I did see her, say, for the first time in probably over a year that I saw her on Friday. And these tracks seem to have come in from the west, so maybe she's come back. But I thought these tracks looked a little bit small for what I remember Shadulu's tracks looking like. Shreya, that's a very good question. Uh, they might be. Cedric's got male leopard tracks there. I had some up close to the camp as well. We haven't seen Tortoise Pan, who's the male from the west. We haven't seen him for oh, quite a while. I wouldn't like to put a, a date in it. I don't think he's been seen since I've been back. So we are in a bit of a drought. But that's okay. You know what Juma's like? We might see no leopards for five or six days and then we'll have four in the same sighting tomorrow. So. We can never give up hope. The bush will show us what it wants to show us when it wants to show us. We don't see those tracks on the road anymore, which is a bit of a shame. But we will investigate, check all the roads around here. The problem is our boundary road is only probably 200 metres off to my right. So that's the road that we cannot cross. The animals can cross, but we cannot. Well, I should say we should not. We could if we wanted to, but we're just not supposed to we're not allowed to. Uh, anyway, right, before I get myself into trouble, uh, let's go back to Cedric and see how his leopard search is getting along. Good luck on that, Ben. Um, yes, we had a uh, male leopard track, but it looks like for maybe Molawati coming down Philemon's cut line all the way down towards Trias Dam and uh, with the male leopard 10 to 1 he's already crossed over into Little Gari so I'm not really going to put too much effort in uh, finding him uh, it's uh, Molawati is another story but I'm going to head into the area where we last uh, left uh, those lions last night um, I'm going to go and just uh, have a squiz there quickly just to see exactly the their direction, of course, for them, body pride. Um, just to see if they might. I, 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 I doubt they. I doubt they're still around that side, but we'll give it a go. Sure. Sorry. I do apologize. <laughs> apologize. The, the, the sun is so so crisp this morning. I think because uh, the air is so clean. 
and that sun is coming out perfect. Let's go take a look. Let's go and see what's happened with those lines. Uh, Chris, yes, I, <laughs> I fully agree. <laughs> I so want to find an effort. Yeah, they, yeah, they're on top of my vehicle tracks from yesterday, and uh, sometimes it can get frustrating really trying to track these leopards down and uh, they pop out uh, behind you. But exactly what Ben says, um, you know, you can go without leopards for a few days and all of a sudden you get like three, four leopards uh, in, a, in a drive. So, you know, that's, that's how it goes. That's how things work. But we try. We try our best just to see if we can get these cats. Especially early in the morning. Now it's perfect time because they might still be like moving around and still, still be active and all before they actually go and settle down somewhere. But uh, I'm going to go towards those uh, lines from where we had them yesterday, the Bali Pride. I just want to go and just to see exactly their direction and which way they moved. Because um, I thought last night they were heading in an easterly direction and that line, those, um, they were out of the zone yesterday because this is not their normal area. So I'm just going to head that side and just going to see exactly where they've moved. They might still be in the same area. They might still be there because their tummies were full. So, but, you know, lions at night time, if they start moving, they'll move. Kimberly, no, I don't think the females are the main hunters, Kimberly. I think uh, it is such a misconception that um, I've, in, in my career, I think I've seen more hunts by male lions than actually females. Um, you know, if you've got a male, a coalition of, uh, or coalition is males. Uh, oh, they went north here. Uh, looks like these lions came all the way up north, though. Uh, maybe towards Gary Dam. Let's just turn, yeah. But yeah, no males, I've seen great hunts by males and all that. So as I say, it's a misconception that males and females. If males are by themselves and the, the brothers are together and they're busy patrolling and they're heading into an area and they see something like buffaloes, yeah, they're gonna hunt. They're gonna definitely try their luck then. And are bigger and so, for them to bring down something more substantial, it's easier compared to females. Sorry, I'm just trying to see where these line tracks have gone. Uh, they all went north. All right, let's go try and go. I don't know if I'm like on dam cam. Didn't we get any lines on dam cam? Because uh, these lines are heading straight towards uh, Gary Dam. Yeah, well, straight towards Gary Dam. Well, let's go take a look. Let's just go take a look. Well, let's hope you find something there, Cedric. We've just picked up the female leopard tracks again going along the road here. So we are still at least in the vague correct area of course as always we're hoping for a little bit of help from our friends out here be they impalas or kudus or even some birds some alarm calls would be nice or maybe if said leopard was to vocalize and start calling uh, which if you've never heard a leopard call it's quite a distinctive noise it sounds like somebody sawing a piece of wood okay. <laughs> that's a bit of a telltale giveaway certainly if we can find or listen out for that so we're trying to use our ears but i have to say i do have a beanie covering my ears because it's a bit cold this morning um, so we will see if we hear anything but between the two of us hopefully we will do so Let's see if we've still got any tracks on the road here this is exactly the route a female leopard took a couple of days ago and we ended up at about the same spot and the tracks disappeared and we found nothing and I'm beginning to fear the worst because I can't find any tracks on the road again. But we'll check all the surrounding area here. 
and so hopefully we'll get a bit of a clue uh, from some of the surrounding wildlife fighting for its life or at least worried for its life Yeah, it looks like quite a small set of tracks, but if it's not Shadula, I'm not sure who else it would be coming in from the west. So she, this does seem to have been the route that she's taken the last couple of times she's been coming in. And it's interesting that she's been coming this side a little bit more, it seems, over the last week or two. Maybe now that her cub is getting a little bit older, she's comfortable leaving him for longer and going a little bit further afield. And she has been neglecting this area uh, of Juma for quite a long time now. In fact, the last time I saw her, other than the other day, uh, she was up close to our camp. Um, she got chased up a tree by a hyena. I think I did a post on it many years, well, probably last year now. But we will keep listening and looking and hoping. Good morning, everyone. We are just waiting on that sun popping up, which is just about to. I think we're right on time. We are also frozen. It is so cold, I want to cry. Oh, the temperatures have dropped. I think, David, I have been very lucky this month as it's been not too bad, but it's getting worse. Good morning. My name is Lauren. That is Davi's very cold thumb. And as I already mentioned, we're waiting on the sunrise. I cannot believe how cold it's getting. But this is our last day in Madikwe and I won't be in Madikwe for a very long time. So I'm feeling all the emotions. As many of you know, I have completely fallen in love with this reserve. I've got to know it very well. And I think the key to success at Madikwe is knowing it very well. I think as a beginner, it can be a really tricky reserve to get to know and sort of integrate into. But once you do know it, and once you are integrated, it is the most wonderful reserve in the whole of South Africa. So I don't know my plans for today. I, I really just want to bumble, see who we bump into and what we find. It's our last sunrise safari. Andrew and Impo will be taken over tomorrow. And I will be getting ready to go to Scotland, where apparently it's warm and there are heat waves. Can you believe it? I am overjoyed at that. Very excited. Summer in Scotland is wonderful. Sometimes. The sun doesn't go down until about 10 o'clock at night. So yes, I am overjoyed. You can also tell me what you would like us to find. As I always say, as long as it's realistic, I will do my best to try and find it for you. I know that Dassies are still on our list. We just have to go to the rocky parts of life to find those. I know that Davi wants to see the Mahiwas, our male lion coalition here. One of them will do. There are two. Haley, you're asking what has been my best stint. I think. stint. Something stint. Yeah, I can only hear my own voice. I'll just wait, Haley. This has been the best stint, if that's what you're asking. A hundred percent. My best sighting. Ooh. Ooh. Haley, that's really tough because finding those cheetah cubs in the fog for the first time, all other vehicles had left, everyone else had given up and we stayed. We couldn't see a thing. It wasn't mist, it was fog. And then we found the mom, but it was a little bit sad because we didn't actually see the cubs. Then we saw the cubs and then the fog started to lift and they made their way towards our vehicle and just sat on a termite mound. That was so special. Finding that leopard up a rock, that beautiful female leopard. It wasn't the longest sighting in the world, but still it was beautiful and she was stunning. Being at the hyena den, having it, the brown hyena den, having it active, seeing that cub. And then, of course, the art wolf for the first time. 
my first time seeing an art wolf, Dobby's first time, and it was in the daylight, so we could really see the animal very clearly, and it was relaxed. I think those were my top four. I won't say the wild dog hunt. I'm not like some of the male guides out here always wanting a hunt. I find that really difficult. I'm not sort of driven to see the hunt. Although I know it's very much part of nature, it's not my drive. So that was a difficult sighting. I think that's it. Is there anything I'm missing, Davi? Nope. It's just been the most wonderful stint. And the sun's just popped his head out. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. You're sending warm thoughts. We take them. We take that warmth. Whew. I'm Scottish after all, I should be able to deal with the cold, but we definitely do not drive around in Scotland in open vehicles. We have heaters, even heaters that heat your bum as you sit in the car seat. We have insulated houses, central heating radiators, <laughs> none of that exists here. So thank you so much, Chris. We appreciate it. I did hear an extremely cold front is on its way. South Africa may be in trouble of snow. Don't know how true that is, but woof, good luck, South Africa. Sir so 50, it's so beautiful. Look at it just touching. The vegetation, kissing the vegetation. It's always worth waiting for the sunrise. But because of that mountain range, we never know quite when it's going to pop up. It actually pops up a lot earlier. We just don't see it because of the mountains. I would love to see those little lion cubs for the first day, for the first time today. That would make my day. They are three months now. They're moving with mom. No one's really had a proper sighting with them. But that would be pretty special. We know roughly where they are, but it's just a case of waiting until you see them with mom and waiting until the sighting happens for you. You're not going and trying to find the Dane and off-roading. Just wait, it will happen. Okay, we're gonna make some plans and decide what we want to do now that we're warming up a tiny bit. And we're gonna send you guys over to Ben. Well, that would be nice, Lauren. I'm sure we'd all appreciate that. And, uh, yes, good luck for your last day. Um, our leopard tracks seem to have disappeared for now, but we're not giving up hope. We're just going to bumble around in this area and see what we find. But I do sympathise with you, Lauren, as how cold Medikoi must be. I was up there last year, I think in July, uh, and, yeah, it's pretty chilly up there for sure. And I also agree with what Lauren said there about it's, it's a different type of cold. As someone who grew up in the UK as well, uh, and should be very used to, um, so I'm just turning my radio down, should be very used to cold weather. There is something, something a little bit strange about the fact that if you look at the ambient temperature out here, it's probably 10 degrees warmer than it would be at this time of the morning in the UK in winter. But it feels icy cold here. There's something about South African winters that make them feel colder than they should be. If you look at the uh, the thermometer, which I've never really understood. And I've actually tried to explain that to my parents. They are coming out for a visit in a few weeks, actually, which would be nice. First time they've been over since 2019, I think. Um, and I've tried to explain to them that it is going to be cold, but I don't think they'll probably fully understand it until they get here. <clears throat> I know I didn't. I didn't even think to bring much of the way of warm weather clothing when I came over here. I thought, it's Africa, it's going to be hot all the time. 
In fairness, it's hot a lot of the time. It's just a few hours morning and evening and winter where it's not. Uh, Chris, it certainly doesn't snow here in South Africa, but there are areas of South Africa that can get snow. So in the Drakensberg Mountains, down the eastern side of the country, towards Lesotho, which is where the highest points of the Drakensberg mountain range are, then yes, there can be snow, and there is sometimes snow. And there used to be, I don't think it's still uh, operating now, but a few years ago, there even used to be, believe it or not, a ski resort in South Africa. How weird's that? I think they had to import some of the snow or bring some of the snow in some years. But not something you would expect to find in South Africa, a ski resort. But it gets very, very cold up there on the Drakensberg Mountains. And, uh, yeah, not unusual to see a little bit of snow-capped peaks. But I don't mind these cold mornings. Um, I know we complain about them, but I complain about them with a smile on my face. Because, to be quite frank, for the rest of the year, I'm just hot and uncomfortable and sweaty. So it's nice to be able to put more clothes on. And I know I may be in the minority here, but I'd rather have it cold than hot. Just on the basis that I can wear six jackets and four pairs of gloves and eight hats if I want. Um, and I can lie under six duvets and a couple of blankets. If you're too hot, you're too hot. And there's nothing you can do about it. You're just hot and uncomfortable. If you haven't got an aircon or a shower, a cold shower or a swimming pool, then you're just going to be hot and uncomfortable. Which is what it is most of the time. Especially when you grew up in a cold climate. You'd think after 20 years I would have climatized to it, but it's, I don't think you ever do. I've had it, the hottest I've ever had it over here in the low felt was 48 degrees Celsius. I know what that equates to, 100 and a lot. Uh, I think it was about 90% humidity. And uh, we had a bushfire. Uh, we were fighting fire in that temperature. It's one of the worst days of my life in terms of comfort levels. It was in an October. Traditionally for me, October and February are the warmest months. Oddly, sort of either side of the season. Thank you, Daniel. I fear that we are in the minority. Um, and maybe it's a boy thing, I'm not sure. But yeah, I've always maintained you can always try and get yourself warm. You can run around, you can put on more clothes, you can go underneath blankets and things. Uh, but if you're too hot, you're too hot. Once you've taken all your clothes off and you're in the shade, there's not much else you can do. And at least when you're active and it's cold, you can warm up a little bit. But anyway, good weather rant. It's always good to have one of those. <laughs> I'm sure my mother will find it very disappointing when she comes over here. I'm expecting to hear that phrase once or twice. Eddie, hey, look, that's rather nice with this tropical tent web spider in the sun. Can we get that? I can move if it's too bright for you still. But there's a the nice thing is looking into the sun, we're not looking directly into the sun, in that fallen tree, there is a lovely tropical tent web spider whose fronds and silk is glowing in the sunshine. Go right a little bit, Odie. Right a little bit more. Right, right, right. There. Top right at the moment of your screen. There it is. Look at that. Huge network. All of those knocked down strands and then you can clearly see that sort of sheet in the centre with a central peak. Uh, that is where the name the tropical tent web spider comes from. Only a little tiny spider, not much bigger than, say, the tip of my pinky finger. But quite an impressive amount of silk. Not the tidiest web you will ever see. Uh, but the whole sort of strategy for the tropical tent web spiders uh, is that they make that sheet and then they have all those knockdown strands above it. So things fly into there, and it's not the most sticky silk in the world. Uh, in fact, it's what we call a cribbolet silk. So it's a bit, little bit more like cotton candy or candy floss, whatever you want to call it. And it's designed to entangle and is more sticky just through um, sort of uh, what's it, like static electricity uh, is, is the way it sort of binds to an insect. But it's just they get stuck in there, they get disorientated, then they drop down onto that sheet, which is a little bit more sticky. And then the spider normally is hanging on the up on the underside of that horizontal sheet. Oh, 
Oh, Jackie, I don't know how long it would take. Not as long as you would think. I mean, some of these massive spider webs that we see in the summer, we see the bark spiders and things, and those orb webs can be a metre and a half in diameter, maybe even two metres. And you can sit there and you can watch one um, create that web in the space of just an hour or two. So I don't know how long it takes this one. It looks slightly perhaps more intricate in terms of, even though it looks like a, a big mess to us, to some extent, there will be a, an idea that the spider has got. It'll have to know where to attach uh, that silk to and obviously keep within its parameters to make it more effective. But lovely to see in the sun. And when you have a nice dewy morning and the sunshine, it's amazing to see just how many spider webs are here that you don't normally see. Okay, but uh, it sounds like Chris may have found him some himself some elephants. Let's go have a look. Indeed, indeed, we have found one elephant and I suspect there might be more of them further into the woods. As I mentioned earlier this morning on my intro that uh, there is a lot of elephants around currently and I don't think this is going to be the last elephants we're going to see this morning. So as I was planning, I am on the northern boundary, right in the far northern parts of the Conservancy. And in saying boundary, it's a mere road, a dirt track. Since Pridelands, the Conservancy forms part of a reserve called the Greater Balule, which is adjacent to the Greater Kruger region in the central western parts of that particular park region and the Balule in itself forms part of the Greater Kruger. There's no physical boundary in the form of a fence separating Balule from the rest of the Greater Kruger effectively incorporating it into the broader system. Bridelands is no different right here on our northern boundary it's basically a road that separates us from our neighbor which means this elephant can move over the road into the next property and these properties are merely maps indicates who owns what animals don't stick to those rules as long as there's no physical boundary they'll move across these boundaries which is a good thing which is a very good thing Elma wants to know if we should be silent in sightings or would it be okay to speak in a normal voice? Elma, a bit of both, but I'll explain why. It's not required to be silent from a safety perspective or an impact on the animal's perspective necessarily. Um, I'm using a normal voice at the moment, obviously not impacting on this elephant at all. So. The wildlife here has mostly learned that these voices are associated with cars or safari vehicles and they've learned that the safari vehicles are not something threatening. Therefore, they kind of like ignore it. So from that perspective, it's not needed. However, there are certain times where you actually want to be quiet. If there's powerful visuals, for instance, there's leopards mating or leopard busy stalking something you know you, again not from an impact perspective but from I would, I would say the essence and the ambience of the sighting sometimes being quiet amplifies the experience for you as somebody who's on safari but it is okay to speak in a normal voice I won't say shout and scream but a normal voice is okay, in most cases. The animals will show you if there's any reason to be quiet. And then again, when there's something really awesome happening, it might be a good idea to just appreciate it in some silence.
And that's another thing that I've often seen in the Kruger Park itself, National Park, where, for those who are not familiar with the park, uh, other than the private areas where we are now, uh, where only private vehicles are allowed, the, the public sector of the park has a good road network where you can actually drive your own car on some of the well-maintained roads of the Kruger. And I've often seen people encountering elephants and they keep the engines running thinking it's a good idea because it allows for a quick escape. And that's one thing we want to do is to switch off our vehicles when we engage into sightings. Once you're in the sighting, switch off. Especially things like elephants. They are a lot more calmer with a vehicle switched off. You might just hear a hum in the background. Um, we are close to our western boundary as well. And there is a railway track. There is a train coming past. So my apologies. It is what it is. We are right on the edge of the Greater Kruger, unfortunately. Right, so we're going to move on and try and find some more elephants. But quickly, let's take a look at the following clip, which will explain to you the EcoCam experience. Are you in search of a unique, unforgettable adventure in the wild? Imagine living with the animals you see on TV while getting an inside look at how a live safari TV show operates. We're thrilled to offer this experience through our 7, 14 and 28 day EcoCam experiences. You'll live in the charming, rustic eco-training camp at Pridelands in the Greater Kruger National Park. Each day, you'll join the broadcast vehicle with a camera operator and naturalist presenter as they broadcast live onto Wild Earth, the 24-7 wildlife television channel that reaches 7 million people a month. And the experience doesn't stop there. You'll also get a taste of what it's like to be a safari guide. Eco-training has been training Africa's leading safari guides for over two decades. You'll participate in guide training, bushwalks, bush clearing and other activities alongside students in the eco-training safari guide group. You'll sleep out in the bush and take turns at guard duty with the guiding students. This is an adventure you'll never forget. To book your spot, visit wildearth.tv forward slash ecocam. If you book in the month of June, you'll receive a 5,000 Rand discount on the 28 day experience. Come and join us for the bush experience of a lifetime. Okay, well, we are still continuing our. I actually feel bad about calling it a leopard search now because I'm not sure what it is. A general circling of an area within which we saw some leopard tracks. That's as far as I'm willing to go at the moment. Our track record over the last week or so has been pretty dire. Um, and yeah, the last tracks that I had were still going down the road we call Zoe's, so just on the eastern si uh, western side. Yeah, but I've got all the way down there. Anna Marie, that's a very good point, yes. Um, with those lions to be wandering around and all the chaos with the buffalo herds coming through of late, I mean, it's been awesome to see those interactions, uh, some of us closer than we wanted to see. Um, but also just to have that many animals on in terms of biomass has been lovely because it's not something that we regularly see, big herds of buffalo like that. Uh, and to bring in a new pride of lions, but yes, it could have had something to do with the the leopards being a little bit scarce, they normally do. If there's plenty of lions around, the leopards will hide away. They just don't want to get involved in that conflict. It is simply not worth it. But to some extent, they are attracted to the areas we saw the other night. I have, I'm absolutely convinced that the reason we saw that our male leopard, Mulawati, down close to the buffalo was because he heard all the chaos of the lions chasing the buffalo around. And he went down to see what was going on and maybe, just maybe, in the confusion, uh, he would be able to benefit from it. Uh, resourceful things. It looks like we have some impala, which is potentially the first animal that we will have seen this morning. So I think, oh, there's a Koki Franklin in the road. Are you going to stay? 
don't know if he's going to stay, Eddie, but can you see the cokey? He's just there in the grass on the right hand side of the screen. You're on him there, Eddie. There. He's just hard to see in the, in the grass. Yeah, the sun's making it very difficult. You can, might just be out there. He is. You can just make out that yellow head. So that's a male Cookie Franklin. That little ground dwelling bird has a very distinctive call, and that's where the name comes from. That goes Cookie, 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 Cookie. See, look, I'm talking to him. Imagine a world where you can positively impact your health with science. There are 40 trillion bacteria in your gut microbiome which regulate your health. If you are suffering from brain fog, sleep disturbances, skin conditions, bloating or low energy, Viome can analyze your gut microbiome and provide you with personalized health recommendations about which foods to enjoy and which foods to avoid. All sent straight to your phone on an app. Take ownership of your health with Viome. Alright, so I've come to the northeastern corner of uh, Juma, of the property. I'm still trying to follow up on those uh, lion tracks, but we found loads and loads of uh, porcupine quills that was lying on the ground just south of uh, Biffelsuk Dam. And it seemed like maybe a leopard has come past here and grabbed a porcupine, but I haven't seen any tracks so far. So we are just going to sit here a little bit and enjoy these hippopotamouses that's here at the Biffelsuk Dam. Of course you can see they are pretty much situated under a bush there in the water. Like three or four. Oh, I've got hyenas calling a little bit further west of us. Sounds like those hyenas are calling a little bit in, just inside Buffelsuk itself. So, I've got another one in the west, east now. You can hear actually one was calling in the west, one was calling in the east. Clearly, like those hyenas were just busy contacting each other, one another. But nice that you see those buffalo, uh, those hippos. 
Oh, well, well, well done, Biko. I've got a uh, elefante. <laughs> hey, hey, Good morning, Mr. Elephant, coming down to the water. Looks like just the well, one male here so far. Maybe a, like a lonely bull coming down to, of course, uh, maybe have an early morning drink. So I'll quickly just take, yeah, it's a young male. Very young, not like the oldest, maybe like a good old 20 year old, but you know, I think it's 17, 18, 19, 20 year old. Anna Marie, yes, it's I think, uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Now we've got to enjoy the elephants while they're here because sometimes we could go for like a week without even seeing an elephant. So, uh, yes, I've, Anna Marie, I fully agree. We must. Uh, Enjoy these elephants, and it's nice to, to see so many elephants once again here on uh, Juma. Good morning, boy. Give me for a, a good old early morning drink. This is a young male, so he's not in the herd. Like these, yes, these young boys usually like when they get to 18, 19 years old, they tend to get pushed out of those big breeding herds, out of the family. And these young boys will venture on by themselves, or sometimes they will join older males just to gain some ex like experience on how to control themselves, how to control their musting periods. But uh, clearly, this male is all by himself. So he's only about like, like, like I say, like he's the size of a female. Uh, he's still got a lot of growing to get through and he's still going to get to at least a good old six ton male but for now I reckon he's still about two tons under his full size it's amazing how they use that trunk as a straw sucking up the water squirting it in their mouth Earth lover, it is. It's very serene. Um, it's beautiful. As I say, once again, I don't have a monitor, but just myself just sitting here and just watching over this uh, dam and watching that elephant drink, it is beautiful. And it's, it's, I love early mornings. Early mornings, to me, it's always such a pleasure just sitting at these dams. And that's one thing when I go and leave as well. I always, I'll go to areas like this now and just going to sit down at, uh, at the dam and sit there for like two three hours take out my cup of coffee some biscuits or rusks as we call them here in South Africa like biscottis and uh, enjoy these beautiful early mornings And sometimes even sitting at the dam like this, just watching elephant, this is a, you'll get surprised. All of a sudden you see a leopard or you see a pride of lions coming in into the area. So you know, sometimes you don't go and look for the animals. The animals will find you. Matriarch wannabe, why is there fewer elephants on, uh, on Juma than pride lands? <sighs> Well, uh, you know what, matriarch, matriarch, matriarch wannabe, I haven't been on Pride Lens, so uh, I can't give you, um, I'm going to say, an, an explanation on that. So um, I haven't been there. Um, no idea. See, Pride Lens is the same as uh, Sabi Sands. It's part of the Greater Kruger Park. So animal uh, elephants are in and out as they please. So... No, no, no idea. Sorry, I won't be able to answer that that question. It was like sometimes on Juma, there's plenty of elephants on Juma. Well, 
But yeah, we are just going to sit here at uh, Biffelzuk Dam and we're just going to enjoy this uh, elephant <laughs> as he's busy spraying some of that water out of his trunk onto the bank. Uh, I'm just going to enjoy this moment. You just saw Birchall's uh, kukul flying in front of the screen there. It's known as a rainbird. It looks like that. He just went right past the screen. It's always nice seeing these young boys, especially when they're busy playing around with the, with the water like that. It is so, so stunning. But it looks like he's now done with his early morning drink. And it seems like he is now going to move back into the thickets and go and have a good old feed for the day. I think all the teams should go around and have the coldest looking bird competition. But to be honest, we've been sitting here a really long time and they don't look that cold anymore. They've started to unstick themselves from their body and now they're having a really good itch and scratch, which is also important in the morning. But when we first arrived, they were just balls of fluff. I didn't even know what bird it was until I got my binos out and I thought, oh, yellow bull tornbows. The neck was completely not visible and just st stuck to the body. <laughs> They've defluffed a little bit as well, and fluffing is the correct word. That's what you call it when a bird fluffs itself up, filled with air. But my goodness, they must welcome that sun so much. Even although they probably don't feel it as cold as we do, they still will feel cold. Isn't that right, Mr. Hornbill? Still not ready to fly, are you? <laughs> oh, see the neck's gone back down. <laughs> Keep your body all huddled up for warmth. Well, that one is ready to fly. There is a second one. Probably going to follow suit relatively soon. Oh, Debs, I could never answer that, what I think about feathers versus fur. I think feathers are perfect for a bird, and I think fur is perfect for a mammal. Either way, they probably will have the same insulation qualities necessary for that species. Feathers are obviously different types of feathers. Birds do have sort of feathers that are more equipped for flying. And then, oh, that's my heater. And then you have feathers that do insulate. Those small, really fluffy feathers normally on the chest are for insulation. So there are different types of feathers, but I couldn't possibly say if one is better than the other. Don't know if that would be the case, Deb. I think it would just be that birds' feathers are perfect to insulate birds. Fur is perfect for those mammals that have fur. 
Fur doesn't quite trap air. They're not really able to fluff like other animals. Whew. I'm just gonna keep driving incredibly slowly. But yes, they will both be equipped to keep that animal warm. But the feathers have to really be cleaned, be preened, maintain that structural integrity in order to do their job during the fluffing process. And those outer feathers, the flight feathers, probably won't do too much for insulation. It'll be those small fluffy feathers, the down feathers that are very close to the body that are really going to warm the bird, the bird up. I am going to continue looking for more cold looking birds. So. We used to have the wet, soggy bird competition. Now it's the cold bird competition. Okay. Birds, here we come. Where are you? <laughs> but it seems like I'm not the only one birding this morning. Well, it's warming up here, thankfully, on Juma, but we found a bird, and I'm sure that uh, it is cold, and maybe it's cold-hearted as well, who knows. But there, hiding behind the leaves, you can just see those lovely little shafts of, uh, well, you could, that sort of metallic-y green aquamarine, and now you can see that nice red bill is a brown-hooded kingfisher, which we haven't seen very many of. In fact, I haven't heard very many of them either recently, which is a bit strange. It's normally our most common kingfisher that we see during the winter months because we have quite a few um, migratory kingfishers here of course the one that is most famous is the woodlands kingfisher which is that beautiful sort of electric blue color uh, that's what we call an intra-african migrant so only here during our summer these guys are here year round and they're normally very vocal we normally hear them going <whistles> here's their sort of normal call but i've not really heard any of that recently so nice to know that they're still around because they tend to sort of disappear when the woodlands are here because they kind of get uh, outcompeted by the woodlands. They come in big numbers and then the brown hooded just tend to sort of disappear into the background for a little while. But the woodlands have been gone for months, but we just haven't seen very many. I was a striped kingfisher last time I was here, which was nice to see. I didn't see too many of those. Obviously, we've got the pieds and the malachites, but of the insectivorous uh, kingfishers, so the ones that don't hang around at water we haven't seen very many of recently so this is rather nice to see it's strange that we have so many kingfishers that specialize in insects as opposed to fish but hey oh andrew that is one of life's many mysteries um it'll be done basically off the uh, sort of the circadian rhythm pretty much um, and the length of day, as well as the temperatures. It'll be a combination of the two, but most animals cue off the length of the days, because obviously in the summer we get longer days, in the winter we get shorter days when the uh, angle of the sun above us changes. So remember during our summer, the sun is almost directly overhead because it uh, follows the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, and that from here is probably only 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers perhaps away from where we sit now. So that's one of the reasons Anything that it gets very, very hot over here. Then in winter, when the angles all change and our tilt is facing in the other direction on the earth, that 23 and a half degree tilt, um, then we get much shallower, uh, instead of direct rays of the sun, we get much more shallow rays, which is why it's cooler. Same amount of energy, but just spread out over a much bigger area. It's like holding a, a torch directly above a table, for example, or holding it at an angle. You spread the light over a much larger area. So that length of day is very important. Um, and a lot of birds have little cues. They have what are called, in li lizards is a good example, actually. They have something called a pineal eye, and many animals have a pineal gland as well. But in lizards, you can actually almost see this pineal eye. It's a little like hole in their forehead, in between their eyes. Uh, and it, you could think of it as a very, very basic eye. All it's really doing is monitoring the changes in daylight, uh, and that will have a knock-on effect to hormones and therefore behavior as well. Navigationally, uh, it becomes very interesting. There's still studies being done trying to understand how birds migrate and are able to find these places. 
Um, but there's all sorts of different factors. Uh, some use the rotation of the night sky if they're flying after dark. Others will use sound. Others will use sm smell. Others will use sight of landmarks. Lots of different ways. Possibly using the magnetic field lines of the Earth as well to help them orientate. orientate. Polarized light. There are lots. Um, Bianca, in terms of the most common species, I would say I would normally I'd have probably said this one, but they've been few and far between over the last few months. I suppose the ones that we see most regularly are the pied kingfishers, uh, which are usually there around the water, and that does make it a little bit easier. Water sources. I think he just flew down into that bush there earlier, but I'm not 100% sure. Hmm. Otherwise, we could, there, oh, yes, there he goes. He is still here. There he is. Um, so yeah, but during the summer, then definitely, um, uh, definitely the woodlands kingfisher. Now this is actually a female of the two. You can see now. You can see her more clearly. So you can see the wing itself is a sort of a brown colour, where her the shoulder would be, I suppose, just before you get that lovely little greenish aquamarine splash. Uh, that says the female, the male is black and the female is brown on those wing shoulders. Okay, but that's made my morning actually, yeah, very nice to see. Uh, right, we're going to send you over to Cedric, who I think is still by Wuffelshoek. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's, it's been a little bit of a slow morning with the cats here, but we are still sitting here at Buffelzook Dam, and there is some hippos that's popping up and down now and again, but it looks like they are all under the water at the moment. I'm just trying to see if they're going to come up again. There is a bit of activity with these hippos, but... Looks like they're a little bit shy this morning. Our elephant did move off. Have you got anything, Rebecca? Doesn't seem like it, huh? Seems like these zippos do not want to pop their heads out of the water for now. But the, one, the morning is uh, heating up, so. Oh, well, there's one right there on the close to the bank area now. Of course, now these hippos are back and forth. So early in the morning, like this, now they'll still be a little bit active in the water. But once it starts uh, heating up, you'll find that these hippos will start settling down in the water and not move too much. Hi there, my name is Robert Williams, uh, Dr. Rob in the Yahoo chat. I've been a longtime supporter of Wild Earth and I just got an email from them informing me that I had won a trip to the Thackeray River Lodge in Medique and I am looking forward to accepting this prize and making a trip to Africa and uh, seeing all the interactions with wildlife, particularly predators like hyenas, in person. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature.
There's an elephant right up ahead here. We just need to get a bit closer. We positioned the vehicle in such a way and then it started moving too quickly. It's heading towards the water itself. We're gonna get a view of it just now. It's going there, okay. Let's get around there. There is an elephant. Let's go and see if it's gonna drink. Yo, at the at the worst time they start moving. <laughs> The moment you got them framed up. And, uh, but we'll just head around. It's right over here. There's more elephants there, actually. Let's go to them, rather. This one might be a bit tricky. A whole bunch of elephants up there. About 100 meters up ahead. We're going to take a look at them. Carl, good morning. Uh, question there, is there quite a lot of elephants currently on Pridelands? Carl, yes indeed. Um, I can't say exactly how many, but I would estimate currently around about 150 minimum. And it will fluctuate. You know, one day there might be 20, the next day there might be 200. There's a big, big old cow there and some babies. So now there's an incredible amount of elephants currently around. Okay, let me just stabilize and then switch off. Sorry about all that driving and noise. But unfortunately our previous elephant started moving just as we framed it up. That seems to be the rest of that herd. Seem to have broken. That there's to be a marula tree. Snapped it in half. Now they are removing branches, and as you can see, this elephant now is putting that branch in its mouth, and it's using its big, big, big molar teeth to grind off the bark specifically after a layer of cells in between the bark and the actual wood. Good morning Mandy. I totally agree with you there. Is watching elephants browse is a very very calming experience. And we'll just see what these guys are going to do. Can you hear that crunching as it's grinding off the bark from that branch? Very big elephant this. I think it's a bull. I think it's a big bull. We did briefly saw a herd yesterday with a massive bull with them. Not as big as Ezelweenie, but a very, very impressive elephant nonetheless. It's not this particular one. I would love to see that other bull again. It's a very impressive bull. For those who don't know who Ezelweenie is, it is one of the largest elephants in the region with massive, massive tusks. And Ezelweeny occasionally comes and enters the Pridelands Conservancy. It's an elephant bull that roams a huge area. So we don't always get to see him here. I haven't seen him in months. Now he does tend to come visit us more often in winter. This is an impressive bull nonetheless.
Uh, Michelle definitely keen to see old Big Ez as we refer to him as well. Ez Albini, that's the elephant that I just described, who's not been seen around for quite some time. Michelle, I'm not sure where he is at the moment. I also would love to, to see that big elephant again. Now, like I said, he seems to come and visit us quite a lot in the dry month. So I'm hoping that that will be the case this year as well. There are a few other bulls that also have entered our area that are impressive. I mean, this is another one. Not nearly as big as Ezelweeny. But that one we saw yesterday, a very, very impressive elephant as well. I think we've got a good chance to, to see that elephant again. Very calm, I must say. It's one thing I've mentioned a few times in the past is that the uh, herds of elephants here in this region seems to be very accommodating when it comes to the presence of vehicles. They seem to have really calmed down a lot. Note how this elephant now use his tusk as leverage to try and snap those branches. Let's just check. Uh, I know that there's one of these elephant bulls with like a cyst on its trunk, but it doesn't seem to be this one. They are just mammals, so there is, they can also get any disease that we get, or conditions, they get cancers, they get cysts, they get sort of joint disorders. I'll stick around with these elephants for a bit to see if I can't see that other big bull. In the meantime, let's head over to Cedric. Might just have had some luck with some cats. Oh. We've, got the, we've got lions, we've got lions and they're busy hunting buffalo. There's buffalo in the uh, background. And we've got this female that's just watching these buffaloes coming down. I'm not too sure. I'm sure this must be the uh, Imbali pride that we had last night. Oh, this is amazing. As you can see, that uh, the can you see the buffaloes in the background in a way, okay? Uh, okay. You can see movement, okay. Sorry, I don't have a monitor, so I'm not too sure exactly what we're always looking at. So I'm, I'm going to be speaking to your BK once or twice. But you can see this female lion just watching those buffaloes coming down towards Gauri Dam. So are they going to... The only problem now is that it is daytime. It's, uh, of course, very light now. It's very warm. So lions tend to kind of... They think twice about it. Here comes another female... Sorry, here comes another female towards the turmoil mound. Yeah, so this is Mbali. I was just looking at the scar on her left shoulder. So this is the Mbali pride. So it's supposed to be five females and two young males. I'm not too sure exactly where the rest of the pride is. We only got the two females for now. Oh my word. Am I in this situation again? Well, this time I'm making sure I'm on the other side of everything. And I'm not going to be... In, that, uh, in the area where the buffaloes will be pushed into my vehicle. So yes, for now, this is a perfect situation, especially for these lionesses. As you can see, they are on a termite mound, beautiful viewpoint, 
They are watching these buffaloes just moving past. And of course, typical cats always showing interest in an opportunity. If there's an opportunity and there's a little calf that's wandering by itself, and they will take that chance then to try and hunt. Nathaniel, definitely, I love hunt, especially in the daytime. But look at this female coming onto the Dermont Mount. Watch her, she is just keeping an eye out. Oh, there's a buffalo that's coming very close. She's just watching this. Oh my word. What a change for the morning. What a change. You can see, keeping the eyes out. As I said, I'm not too sure where the rest of the pride is. It's just these two females. But I think for these two females, these are the two younger females. So um, I don't know where the older female is. I don't know where the two young males are. That is the, that is the question. Where's the rest of the pride? Because you see, that's the female with the scar at the back end of her leg. Remember yesterday we saw her? So she's the female that had that scar. That was, uh, it seemed like, uh, not last night, but the night before. She uh, picked up a, a wound when they were busy hunting buffaloes and she got a bit of a, maybe like a hornet dug into the side of her there, but nothing too serious, just a little bit of a flesh wound. This is amazing! Alka, yes, definitely. Looks like the Mbollies love the uh, uh, buffaloes. So sometimes you'll find certain prides that will actually specialize on certain species. Um, so like the Mbolli pride, well, I remember back in the days, the Nkuhuma pride used to specialize in buffalo, big time. I mean, they used to always go for buffalo. Um, but uh, yeah, the Mbolli pride, looks like they're enjoying following uh, these buffaloes. The Chalala pride used to go for giraffe. They were special. They specialized in giraffe, which was in quite an interesting thing. But this is amazing, just watching them, just watching these buffaloes. But I don't think they're going to really take an opportunity, especially two young girls like this. Watch, maybe a bit of a greet. No, watch the one female. Just still looking, still interested. <laughs> but I don't think uh, they're going to do too much for now, unless there is a... An old buffalo that's injured or a calf that's uh, lagging behind, then it's a different story. But if it's a big buffalo for these two girls, uh, look at she doesn't want to make too much noise. She's just going very slowly, very cautiously up uh, that termite mound. <laughs> Crafty Jack, yes, brace ourselves for a situation that we don't know what's going to happen. So, yes, I've... Crafty Jack, trust me, I think I don't know all about that over the last uh, few days with buffaloes and lions. But that looks like that herd of buffalo is moving straight down towards Gowry Dam. So, if that's the case, I'm sure these lions will... I'm sorry, I'm just quickly turning around here. Yeah. Is there another one on the road? Uh, is there a line there? All right, there's another one. So BK just gave me an update on there's another line that's moving towards this side. Yeah? Oh, going towards the buffaloes. Oh. All right, well, we will try and reposition very shortly. You think we'll try and go right? You're right, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the other pride, the rest, the rest, okay, let me just go around that side, so we got a little bit of a better view. Alright, there you go. we're just going to go shoot around this side, into this direction. Alright, just want to see where that other one's are, but I think it's nice like this, eh? Eh? Yeah. I'm going to, let's just, yeah, because the light is so beautiful on them at the moment, I don't want to really change too much. 
because it's that early morning golden light that's just pretty much bouncing off these uh, lionesses. Oh, look at them. Yes! Sorry, I'm just so happy. What a way to have a Thursday, a Thursday morning drive. Oh. And just the body condition of uh, these lions yeah, in the in Bali Pride. They are immaculate. There's no nothing showing or there's no signs of them not being successful with hunts or anything like that. You can just see there's no hips that's showing, there's no ribs. They've got beautiful bodies, beautiful muscles, and uh, perfect. No, so 50, definitely I think uh, BK is loving it. Uh, this is exactly what we were hoping for. It just shows you, a morning can change from sitting at a, a dam and looking at hippos that do not want to be seen to lions busy hunting buffaloes. That's how it happens, that's how, that's how it works in the, in the bush. You know, things change just like that. But the question is, where's the rest? Like BK said, he saw one other line on the road. I wonder where the rest of the pride is. Oh, but look at this female just giving us the eyeball. She's not too bothered about the buffalo. She's looking completely in the opposite direction. She's more worried about what's for breakfast. Oof, Earth Lover, I'm not too sure. I don't think they'll take over the territory. I think Earth Lover, like last night I was saying, when we found them there, you know, when we got them and they were going towards Chilapan, my, funny enough, actually, uh, my assumptions at that time was they're going to go straight east or go straight north. Sorry, I just hear a lot of buffaloes running. Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, I thought it was the like buffaloes running again. My ears are so so in tune with buffaloes running at the moment after the other night that I don't want to be <laughs> in that situation again. Um, but Earth Lover, no, I think you'll find that uh, these uh, lions will um, go back north again. But I think they're just following this herd of buffalo. They're very keen. They, they you know, they, they want to see if they can bring down a, a full-grown buffalo and have a good meal for the next two, three days. Um, but yes, they are in a territory of the Telemati breakaways. So that will be another thing. If the Telemati breakaways, those two females and their five youngsters, if they come into this area with the S8 male, it is, it's going to be quite interesting to see what pans out. Um, especially that the S8 male, is, uh, he's also the, dom the dominant male for uh, these... Uh, for the uh, for these young males and these two young females in or three young females in that in Bali Pride, so I mean he's not going to do anything more because it's his offspring. But there we've got a young male. There's one of the young males coming through. Of course, one of uh, the two young boys of the Bali Pride. He's just standing there in the shade at the moment. Still listening out the buffalo are right here. They're just on the other side of the Termite Mount, so oh, he's going to lie down. Oh, he's not too interested in in the hunt for now. But it is typical for the uh, for morning like this. Uh, and lions they don't want to go and spend too much energy now. Uh, Renata, uh, how long and how far do lions follow buffalo heads? It could be f for like five minutes, it could be for five hours, it could be for a day. It's very difficult. There's another one there. Uh, it looks like the entire pride is coming this side. So, yeah, it's very difficult to say, Renata. I mean, it's, you know, as I say, as soon as, like now, you can see they're not going to show too much interest. And, She's seeing something. This female's seeing something above BK. It's a head. 
maybe like there's a, a straggler, a straggler that's uh, like kind of falling behind. Maybe another buffalo that's just a little bit behind the rest of the herd. And that's the thing. As soon as they find a, a, a single buffalo that's lagging behind, then they're going to look at that opportunity. Yeah, see, there's other females going down now. Yeah, I think there is another buffalo, and there must be another buffalo coming this way. I'm just trying to look behind us here. Oh my word. Are we going to see a hunt? An early morning hunt? Well, these two girls are showing a lot of interest. Watches. I do apologize about our aerial because uh, these lionesses have <coughs> just come behind us. So they are going to. Yeah, they're showing interest there. It might be like another buffalo that's just fallen behind. So these two girls have shown interest. You can just see. Ears pointed forward, head. Oh, there is a buffalo. There is a buffalo. Look at that. There's a buffalo there. Oh my word, what are they going to do? But it's just the two of them, where's the other? Oh, there goes another one. Another lion that's gone the other side, a little bit further west. Okay, let's see what their plan is. This is going to be very interesting. Okay, so they're busy spreading out now. You've got the one lioness in the middle. The other one went to the right, and the young male went to the further, uh, like the furthest uh, western side of that buffalo. So you can see they are just taking a look. That buffalo's got no idea that these lions are approaching. This could be very. Oh, look at this! And this is exactly this opportunities that they're looking for. They can get too close to it. That... Now the big females are coming in. The older female lioness is coming in. So we've got the entire pride that has picked up on the body language of each other. And they're knowing that's good. Oh, she's, watch, watch, watch. She's going closer. She's getting there. Oh, she's right there with that buffalo. She's going to go down because she doesn't want that buffalo to see. I must make sure that the buffalo doesn't see her. Ooh, this is gonna be interesting. Oh, the buffalo sees it. Oh, the buffalo sees her. Oh, now it's gonna. It's a big male buffalo. It's gonna be a very tough one now for them. A big male like that, it is quite tough. They'll need the assistance of all members of the pride to try and bring bring down that buffalo. This is exactly what they try and do. They try and see if they can get that single buffalo that's separated from the herd. Oh, this other female's approaching now. But this buffalo is going to come for them. He's not going to. Chris, oh, the buffalo sees. No, the, the buffalo's done. They're running. They're running after it. They're going. They're going after it. Let's go quickly. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's see where our father got. Ah. You're on a Vubu road. Oh, they're chasing. Oh, that buffalo is going to be running for dear life. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, they are. Uh, no, that buffalo's already run right across. His <laughs> buffalo has bolted. Well, there's another buffalo here in front of us. It might be the same one. Sorry, Ibika, I think we've got the same one here. There's another, that buffalo's still here. That buffalo's still here. It's coming back now, that buffalo's coming back to where the lions are. But you can see this young male with a female just behind him. Well, now they singled this one out. Oh, 
looks like he's yawning. He's like, oh, oh the buffalo's coming back again slowly towards him. Yeah, the buffalo's coming back. Oh, they're a little bit worried about this buffalo because he is a big male. So uh, it's going to be a very, as long as this buffalo doesn't come towards me. I don't want to have uh, part two in my uh, moment with the buffalo. I don't want all BK to think that I'm a bad omen to lions and buffaloes. Judy, this is Wowzers. It just shows. <laughs> This is amazing, and what's even what's more amazing, it's just like understanding how lions work when they're coming to hunting buffaloes and that. You saw the other night; they are clever. They they just want to disturb the buffalo, so they actually want the buffaloes to, I can say, turn around and come back for them. Because once they start doing that, they start breaking up into little smaller factions. And once they start breaking up into smaller factions, you'll find that all of a sudden you get individuals that starts, you know, they, they are like kind of more left alone. And that's when they start singling out those individuals. So the lions. There's two buffaloes. Oh, yes, it mustn't come for me now. I'm just like, uh, I don't want to get into that position. I uh, see that's grumpy and it's looking at me again. I think it might be actually... So I'm just... This buffalo definitely knows it is, it, it's uh, being surrounded by lions. So that's clever. So if it's two buffaloes, okay, one buffalo is coming in front of us here now. A big male. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm cool. Uh, yeah. Elizabeth, yes, and on top of that, it's two. It's two big males. So if it's two, oh, don't do this to me. I'm I'm. <laughs> I'm trying to send some good positive vibes to the buffaloes. But if it's two males like this, that's that's tough. You can just see quickly, the males will go like kind of team up together. So instead of being a single male, you've got two males. And if you've got two males, well, if one gets brought down, at least the other one can back the that one that's being brought down up and all that. And that's how buffaloes work. Especially these old boys, they experience. I mean, this is not their first rodeo. With lions, definitely not their first radio, but uh, yeah, these these lions are still on their trail. You can see the young male walking around there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, they've given up. They realised. Well, look, if it was one male, maybe, but if it's two big boys, nah. Not worth, not worth the effort for now, unless if it's a male that's injured and he's completely by himself, then maybe. But now, no. Good choice. Rather let these buffaloes be. And these buffaloes are going to join the rest of the herd. All right, let's go and try and see if we can locate on those lines. <laughs> <laughs> what a morning! What a morning! As always, so it's it's so nice just to watch those lions and their strategies and how they go about it, and um, you know, and I'd like always say like, sit with the lions. Oh, they they oh they further up that one. Oh, they're still here. All right, let's go a little bit further up. Maybe going towards this termite mound here. But always sit with the animals, sit with them, and just see things how things play out. And I mean, that's always important. All right, we're going to try and uh, reposition here quickly and see if we can get them. Well, well done, Cedric. You seem to be following all the action around. Well, we are stalking a ground scraper thrush. 
that is also stalking something, uh, some form of little arthropod. Wandering around on the ground there looking for breakfast because they're specialised in eating, well not, not particularly specialised, but they'll take little arthropods, they do like termites, they like beetles, grasshoppers, those sorts of things. Uh, we often find them uh, on this particular road where we are at the moment because it's had a, a fire break cut around it, so a nice short grass which is perfect for the, uh, for the ground scraper thr thrush. Of all the thrushes that we get, or the two thrushes species that we get here, this one prefers the most sort of open areas. The other one we get here is called the Kurachani thrush, or the Kurricane thrush, depending on your preference. That tends to prefer slightly more heavily vegetated areas, but this one has decided that it's got to go and hide in the bushes. It's, have you got, got in there, Odie, or no? No, let's move forward a touch. But lovely birds, these ones. See them hopping around on the ground with that, hopefully you saw that nice sort of polka dot, black and white areas. He's sitting on that mound. Oh no, it's just moved again. Yeah, in there. There's a lot of disturbance here of where the elephants have dug up the roots. And that's where he was sitting. There he is. Now, yeah, if he turns around, you can see all those nice sort of black blotches on his chest. But we have a pair of them. They always seem to be on this little stretch of road. I haven't discovered where their nest is, but it'll be interesting to see because the literature suggests that they often nest close to forktail drongos, uh, which make like a hammock nest between two branches. These ones tend to be, they'll just build a cup nest. Uh, in the fork of a tree, but often in close proximity to drongo nests, apparently. And drongos are well known for very actively defending their nesting area. They're aggressive, uh, fearless little birds. So I suppose it's a good idea to take advantage of your neighbour's aggressive habits and protect your youngsters in the process. But he's oh, sitting a bit better there. There we go. See nice. If you turn around, you can see those lovely markings on the chest. Quite a striking bird when you see it. We do get other thrushes, uh, olive thrush, karoo thrush, more in the Gauteng region, and some down in KZN as well. I can't believe this elephant bull's still around. He's just happily, happily consuming his marula snacks there. Marula bark. And now that we talk about it, you know, it's obviously nutritious. Marula is, is one of the most nutritious trees out here for a lot of animals. When we know that they bear the fruits in summer, which a variety of creatures, including us and elephants, utilize. But the bark for elephants contain a lot of nutrients, fiber, all sorts of things. Possibly even medicinal qualities to it. We know that marula bark holds a lot of medicinal qualities for us, so it makes sense that there might be certain times where elephants will consume the bark of marula and the bark of other trees, leaves, herbs, and they also get sick just like us. Well, it's difficult to prove these things, but you know. I don't only think it's only about nutrition. The only the only thing that is a bit worrying here is that the fact that it's pushed down such a massive marula tree now. And being a very big, prominent tree in the area, they play a vital role in stabilizing the soil as well. And by removing too many of these trees, it can actually have a detrimental effect eventually on, on the grassland systems. As much as they are environmental engineers, and you know, they do maintain the grassland, but they can have a very negative effect. Gavin uh, wants to know if it's an instinctive thing for them to strip the bark of trees, or is it something that they are taught? Gavin, it's very likely a bit of both, probably veering more towards a taught skill. Elephants are very intelligent creatures, and they have a long childhood, just like us. Uh, 
we also consider them going into their teenage years uh, much at the same time as we do, puberty, etc. So the, the first years, first 10, 12 years of their lives, they do spend as toddlers and, and, and as kids. And during that time, the parents, as well as other elephants, do teach them a few things. They do pass on knowledge to the youngsters as to what's edible, how to eat these things, where to find them. But there will definitely be some form of instinct involved there as well. And possibly a bit of trial and error in addition to that. But for most part, it is something that are being taught to these young elephants by older elephants. Uh, the mothers play a vital role there. So they do learn from other elephants as well. Probably more so than instinctively just eating bark. So they get taught essential survival skills and they then from there onwards also a bit of trial and error as well as experience as they grow older. That will all aid in, in, in doing this. I mean, compared to humans, you know, we, we also instinctively know how to suckle. We instinctively know how to chew when mum gives you your first meal and to swallow it but we also learn what to eat and what not to eat from our parents and families and elephants are no different in that respect very intelligent creatures remember very elevated sort of self awareness they experience and show emotions so they've elevated beings mentally, which indicates that it's possibly, it's a lot of thought as well that they employ. Incredible memory capacity. So it is true that they don't forget. And it's not a myth. The memory capacity is staggering the amount of detail they can remember. And that's a vital skill because remember Africa, especially out here where we are, it's a variable environment. So we've got seasonal variances that happen every year, dry and wet seasons, but we also go through large scale disruptive events, floods, excessive rains, like we had this year, more than double our mean annual rainfall for the season. And they can go through prolonged droughts And that, you know, you need to be able to adapt, and especially in the case of elephants, which are very long-lived creatures. And it's, it's, it's nice that you are sending us these questions and comments. It is, after all, a live and interactive experience. So keep sending us questions, comments, anything that you'd like us to know. Even if there's something that you'd like me to try and find for you. All right, so you have to register on the Wild Earth website in order to be able to ask questions. And for those on YouTube, just subscribe to the YouTube channel and you will receive notifications if there's any other amazing content around from Wild Earth on these live safaris. Send us Send us questions. We feed off those questions. Provides us with energy. And we already had a question or two about this particular elephant. I think after this, I'm probably going to move on and try and find something else. We spent some great time with these elephants this morning. And I know there's been a request or two for elephants indeed. I'm glad that we were successful in finding some elephants and we'll probably see some more of them right here at Eco Training Pridelands Conservancy. Talking about Eco Training, it's an establishment that specializes in the training of future nature guides 
And if you would like to know more on how to become a guide or join one of those courses, more specifically the professional field guide course, the flagship course, take a look at this following clip with regards to the professional field guide course at Eco Training. Looking to pursue a career as a professional field guide in the African bush? Eco Training's professional field guide course can make that dream a reality. This comprehensive program comprises approximately five months of theoretical and practical training in the African bush with highly qualified instructors where participants will complete various certificate courses. You'll learn essential skills such as animal behavior, tracking and identification, as well as gaining in-depth knowledge of the African bush and its ecosystems, all while living in a real-life safari camp. But the learning doesn't stop there. Following the theoretical and practical training, students will embark on a placement program period of five to six months. During this time, you'll work alongside professional staff and management at a property, putting your newly acquired skills into practice and gaining substantial practical experience. You'll gain invaluable working experience that will set you apart from other job applicants and meet people that think like you. You'll develop your skills as a field guide, hone your leadership and communication abilities, and gain a deeper understanding of the importance of conservation and sustainable tourism. Eco Training's Professional Field Guide course is the ultimate training program for those seeking a career in the African bush. With expert instructors, hands-on practical experience and the opportunity to gain multiple qualifications, you'll be fully prepared for a fulfilling and rewarding career as a professional field guide. Enroll today, locally or internationally, and receive 5,000 Rand off using this promo code. Take the first step towards your dream Bushveld job today. Right, we're still with uh, this in, in Bali Pride. And the Mbali Pride is still busy filling those uh, buffalo, but uh, as I say, they, they see where the buffalo is heading, and that's in a southerly direction towards Gauri Dam. So these lions did first go north, and now they have decided to rather double back and head on to the northern side of that herd of buffalo. And I think they're going to just keep their eyes and ears open for that herd. Oh, look at this, two brothers. So these two young males, they, these are like brothers. So you must understand that these two young boys, they are gonna hang out together forever. So they are gonna one day create a territory for themselves. So they won't be with this pride forever. Sooner or later, they're gonna have to move away and look for a territory of their own. And they'll stick together as a coalition better that way so if you've got two uh, two males it's better than being by yourself but for now they are still with the pride and they're still helping the pride on their hunts and you can imagine five females and two young males like this definitely quite a formidable pride especially if you've got those uh, three younger females now with the older females Annette, there's five females and two males. Five females and two males. To me, that I've been looking at it at the moment for the last few days. They've got definitely an older female, beautiful female. She's like the, the biggest of them all. And then she's got with her uh, four younger females. And then she's got two young males. But when I'm talking about young, maybe about like four-year-olds. So, as I say, those young females... Uh, at the end of the day, this this pride is definitely going to be quite uh, formidable. If you're going to have five females in a pride and strong females, um, that is going to be fantastic. So you can imagine when all of them go into, into heat, into estrus, and they get a male, a dominant male that's going to start mating with them. You can imagine how many cubs, if you've got five females, and say three of them go into heat and each one has four cubs. So that is, what, 12 cubs. 
So uh, I'm hoping we can get to see this pride more often because it is definitely good times to come for this pride. All right, let's let's head. Okay, looks like they are heading a little bit further um, east from where we are now. So we're going to just try and see if we can follow you. Eh. Erica, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's definitely buffalo. There's the little calves in that herd. Um, it was a nice. It was a nice herd. I think it was at least uh, maybe 100, 150 buffaloes in that herd that came past us. So yeah. All right. Um, now this block is uh, <laughs> this block is going to be a very interesting block because uh, I've been through this block a few times, especially with the leopards, Tlalamba and Marips, and uh, it's not a it's not a easy it's not an easy block to get through. Hmm. Yeah, we just got this one young male. A light male. He's, a, he's he's actually the out of all of them. He's like the most. He's the, he's, the, he's the most like he's like the shyest out of all of them. He doesn't like to be seen too often. Uh, my uh, <laughs> porcupine quills. Yes, funny enough, BK and myself found a whole lot of porcupine quills this morning, uh, just uh, south of uh, Biffelzuk Dam. Seems like a porcupine was uh, like taken down there, but nobody has driven that road for the last day or two, so there's, I couldn't find any tracks there. But just quills all over the show, all over. And I think quills make the most beautiful, if you're actually making a beautiful like, painting, or even if you've got like a canvas sheet and you print a, a, a leopard or lion or something on that canvas sheet, and then you just surround it with those porcupine quills, like a, like the, like the, what you call it, like a frame. I think it's beautiful, don't you think? A little bit of art there. I think my sister-in-law Zalia, she's an artist, and she's shown me a few tricks there, and she's very good with that kind of stuff, using natural, natural stuff as uh, artwork. So Zalia, I'm sure you are watching. Thank you very much for that little bit of uh, insight and tips on using natural stuff for art. Right, these, these lines are still looking at it down south, but I don't think they, I'm sure they're going to settle down very soon. Through the years, Wild Earth has brought me comfort and joy hold your breath moments and adrenaline rushes. I've learned so much from the naturalists and I enjoy so much watching these beautiful animals. So I had to give back and I became an explorer and now I've been given this beautiful prize. Thank you Wild Earth and Camp Big Tree for my three night stay to explore Addo National Park. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself.
would agree, but an Anyala uh, cow with her, or not Anyala ewe, we should say, with her youngster just disappearing into the bushes. Um, but there's a good reason that we've just rushed over to this side of the reserve because we had reports that a female leopard had crossed onto Juma from our eastern boundary, or over our eastern boundary cheetah cut line, into this sort of area. Uh, nobody is with said leopard at the moment, but we have, we're probably about 10 minutes late as to when she was seen, but we are going to focus the last little bit of drive in this area, so we thought it would be a good idea to just watch these in Yala in case they see something, but they look quite relaxed, so I think we're going to keep going and try and figure out exactly where this leopard crossed over the boundary. We don't know who it is. It was seen by one of the vehicles who doesn't come on to Juma, so they just sent us a message to say that uh, a leopard had just crossed into Juma somewhere around here. So we are crossing fingers that maybe there are some spots in our future. Now this is Central Road. I've just come along Central in case she was walking there, but we heard she crossed somewhere close to this road. I'm not sure whether it was on the road or just north or just south of the road, but that's why we're here. We're going to go and have a look around, but it's good to know that we do have some antelopes in the area, which, who knows, may attract said leopard, but may also alert us to its presence if it spots the leopard before we do. I'm just saying, over here in the east, chances are it might be the Queen Columba. It's the leopard that, it's the first one I think of if I think of a female leopard in this area. Uh, unfortunately, she, these days, she doesn't stick to the roads very much. So we may be just hoping for a little bit of good fortune. I say we, what we really want is a clue from something else. So we're very close to the boundary now. We're just trying to scan, hoping to just see some movement more than anything. If she's lying in this thick stuff, though, it's uh, in this long grass, it's nigh on impossible. Uh, what we're hoping for is just a little flick of the tail, maybe, or some some evidence or an alarm call would be great. Um, Camilla, I think for a, for a female leopard to hoist, or maybe a young kudu, she wouldn't be able to get a whole kudu up there, but a kudu calf perhaps. Um, I've seen them take out full grown female kudus before, which is like four times their size, and, but they wouldn't be able to lift that up into the tree. I generally work on the basis that at an absolute push, if their life depended on it, they might be able to lift twice their body weight. So a big female leopard about 40 kilograms, uh, so maybe up to 80 kilograms if, if she had to. I think anything beyond that is possibly pushing it a little bit. Uh, but you never know. We do, people do strange things under times of stress, uh, or strange feats of strength. Right, so just having a look to see here, we're on the eastern boundary. Let's see if we can find where the tracks crossed, or where at least the vehicle said they turned around on the road. So I'm also looking for their vehicle tracks, and then we've got a better idea of exactly where to start looking. Otherwise, there is a road that runs parallel to here. Uh, that will be the next thing to check, but I don't see any evidence yet. May also be worth checking the next road down because uh, the people who called it in are not regular users of this property, so they may have got the roads mixed up, but we will check and we will let you know. In the meantime, while I do that, we're going to send you over to Lauren Amidikoi. We have arrived to the bat caves and we thought we'll continue doing some birding. I think we could be looking at a swallow-tailed bee-eater here. It's definitely a bee-eater, but instead of being the little bee-eater, I think it's a swallow-tail, which is quite unusual. We have seen them here, but definitely not as common as the little. But obviously it's a bit of a long distance visual. Oh, my monitor is zooming today. That is wonderful news. It's a very moody uh -huh, monitor. If it's too hot or too cold, it doesn't want to work. Yes, I think we're looking at the swallowtail. 
beautiful bird. Also quite green with splashes of yellow, which makes you think it's a little, but it's got a lot of blue that you can see from here. And it's that turquoise blue going into royal blue that tells you it's a swallowtail. And the shape of the tail is quite iconic too. It's deeply forked. But I can't do the cold bird competition anymore because all the birds are warm. They are no longer cold. <laughs> it's warming up slowly but nicely. And we've had a quiet morning. So we just thought, come to bad caves. Just enjoy the bad caves for a while. Esme, bee eaters are your favorite type of bird. They're one of mine too, Esme. I love the color palettes. I love the color green. And I think the green that you find on bee eaters is just, mm, it's just delicious. And they are so cute. The carmines, oh, that pink coloration. But you do find quite a selection here in Medikwe. We've seen the little, we've seen the carmines, we've seen the swallowtailed, we've also seen the white fronted and the Europeans. That's quite a big selection of bee eaters that you can find here in this reserve. I definitely will miss big geological structures like this, that's for sure. Although I am surprised when we come here these days, I don't know if it's just through seasonal change, we're not finding much. It's very quiet. I was hoping to find the mocking cliff chat. It's a beautiful bird that I've only ever seen at Medikwe. But so far, no luck with that one. I think if you actually just sit here for long enough, you can. sort of start to see things, especially birds. You do get baboons around this area. There are sometimes reports of leopards, but I mean, the reports normally come a little bit more west from Ambush Alley. Clip springers, that would be a great find for, for today. There is a monogamous pair that hang around here. But of course, the day is just starting. I wonder what it would be like to go up and explore those caves. I would never do it. I think it's quite disrespectful to the area unless you are on a proper tour. But I wonder what it would be like. Lauren, I'm challenging you today because I know it's your last day. I think you should go into that bat, uh, bat caves, you and Darby, and go and explore. Dig deep. Dig deep. <laughs> Good luck. Take a flashlight with you, some water, and go in. <laughs> but yeah, we are still sitting with the uh, Mbali lions. Uh, clearly they are now becoming more relaxed, lying here in some shade, as the day is heating up very quickly. It's amazing. This is exactly why I love the low felt. The low felt's weather is by far, by far, the best weather you'll ever get. Early morning's fresh, but once that sun comes up, it just heats up immediately. So from drinking coffee in the morning to drinking nice good cold water later on. Now that's why these lines are very much relaxed now and I think they're going to settle down for the morning or for the day. I don't think they're going to move much more from where they are now. They know exactly where the buffaloes are. They know that the buffaloes are south of them. So it's exactly how lines will work it out. They plan it. They hear at them, they don't have to see them, but they can pick up on the scent, pick up on the noises, 
of the buffaloes moving around and what the lions do they will just position themselves lie in the shade relax for the day let the buffaloes do their thing and of course one that sun starts uh, setting once it starts becoming darker then the lions will move in for their hunt As I said earlier, I said earlier, this is not the last elephants we're going to see. And in fact, this is still right there where we had that bull. It's still part of the same group. And they spread out over more, a larger area, probably about on about a mile. And that's a herd of, I would say, at least 50 elephants. So I can hear them from here all the way to the dam, which is about a kilometer away from us. You can hear branches breaking. I can hear some to our south. And just around us here, there's already about 20 elephants that we can see. So that's a massive group of elephants. Seems like it's an elephant morning today. Yeah, at Prylands. It's a good time to be an elephant on Prydlands. There's so much food at the moment. There's still a lot of green grass, in spite of it being winter. Lydia wants to know, Lydia is asking if different elephant herds will mingle and then separate again. Lydia, yes, I've seen that happen quite a lot. Uh, elephant herds, when they meet up, there's, it's usually a relatively peaceful encounter since elephants are not territorial, not the bulls and definitely not the herds of females. They have home ranges and these home ranges could and does overlap with other herds of elephants. Sometimes these herds might be loosely related as well. We'll find that they tend to move in super groups. We have loosely connected herds within the individual herds, obviously family, but herds might be somewhat related distantly to each other. And then you'll have like four or five or six different herds that moves together, you know, over a wide area, but they'll move through a different, an area at that time. And that's probably what we have here at the moment. And, but they will, even with non-related herds, uh, they often join up at places like water hole feeding areas. And like I said, the interaction are usually relatively peaceful when it comes to that. They're not very aggressive animals by nature, in fact. It's when you get them angry or threatened when they can become very dangerous. We see it when they see lions. But if there's like a herd of buffalo or a rhino moving past, relatively peaceful. When provoked, they are one of the most dangerous creatures on the planet. But as you can see, these guys have no problem with us and our presence in the form of a vehicle. Because they don't see the vehicle as something threatening. If we were to walk you on foot, that would be a different story where then the human figure is exposed and that is something they do recognize instinctively as a potential predator. They see us as a predator that can harm them. When we're in the vehicle, they don't see people. They see the car and they associate the movement and sounds of the car with something non-threatening. And that's why we have sightings like we have in front of us currently. The 
But yeah, elephants. Oh, that's such a privilege just to spend time with them. Good day, Michael. And the question they will heard adopt calves that have lost their mothers. Michael, definitely some evidence pointing that they possibly will do that. There's been a number of records of that actually happening. Sometimes within a herd scenario, a mother might potentially die. In cases of relatives nursing the babies as well. It's also cases of them being abandoned. Perhaps the herd feels like there's not a way in order to save an orphan. Where's the possible amount of energy that needs to be spent might not be worthwhile. Maybe it's a calf that is born with a deformity or something. Some weird things happen. But to answer yes, I don't think it's something that's relatively common, but it has definitely been observed. Just coming back to what we've always been saying about these elephant herds, that they're a very tight-knit family group. And the bond between family members, especially the females, are very, very strong. And it is a time of plenty when it comes to elephants. I mean, we don't we don't even set out to look for them. Amanda wants to know how common it is for lions to hunt elephants at Pridelands. Amanda, yeah, it is very uncommon. It's very uncommon throughout most of the Greater Kruger. I have personally witnessed accounts where it has happened. Again, not something that I commonly witness. I've not seen the lions hunting elephants here. I have worked in a region where there was a pride it is in the Timbavati that occasionally hunted young elephants. But in those cases they created enough confusion for youngsters to be separated from a herd because believe me elephants are very efficient at deterring lions away from the youngsters. They're very aggressive towards lions wherever they see them. However, if you go to parts of northern Botswana, northeastern Botswana, there's a well-known area up in the Chobi and Muremi areas where there are prides that are specialist hunters of elephants. where the hunting of elephants are well documented. Where elephants make up a regular part of those particular prides' prey community. And those particular prides, very large prides, they've also developed and perfected the techniques of taking down even relatively grown elephants. It's a very disturbing act to witness. Because it's not a very quick thing. Usually a lot of distress calls and it's, it's not pleasant to watch. It's efficient, works for those lions. But under normal circumstances, generally speaking, lions don't actively target elephants unless there's a target of opportunity. We spoke about orphans, maybe an orphan who's got lost, a young elephant calf that's gotten lost and is not with a herd, lions can definitely, definitely target those. And that's because of the size of elephants, it's a difficult animal to bring down. Lions are not designed really to hunt elephants.
Do you sometimes imagine what Wild Earth would be like without adverts? A chance to properly immerse yourself in nature without any interruptions. Sign up to be an explorer for a small monthly fee and you can truly escape into the wilderness. Ad free viewing is now available on our app as well as on our website. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Right, looks like our Imbali pride has decided to go and settle down now. So you can clearly see they are in that sleepy mode where they're not going to move too much unless there's a herd of elephants that's going to come past here and chase them. Or if there's a buffalo or kudu or impala that's going to be moving past, then it's a different story. But for now, the day or the morning is heating up and they are going to have a beautiful rest here in this grass, in the shade. So clearly we can try this afternoon again. We'll come past here this afternoon and we will follow up on them. Oh, maybe, oh, she's, she's just going to look for some shade. I think she was just lying in some sun there. Yep, she's going to go in the shade. Anna Marie, yes, I'm hoping that these in Bali, uh, all this in Bali pride gets uh, better luck next time with these buffaloes. But, as I said, I think uh, they know where the buffaloes are. They know exactly. Those buffaloes went straight down to Gary Dam. Those buffaloes are going to have uh, a good old drink that side. And then those buffaloes, 10 to 1, they'll come back north into the thickets, start feeding on the grass, maybe even have a bit of a rest somewhere. And this pride knows exactly their movements because they know exactly where they went to. They know exactly the movements of that herd, of the buffalo herd. And you'll find that this pride later this afternoon, once the sun starts setting, once it becomes nice and cool, you'll find that this pride will go and follow up on that herd of buffalo to see if they're going to get any luck on taking down another buffalo. So, this afternoon, guess what we are doing? We are going to follow lions hunting buffalo. That's this afternoon. So make sure that you do join us on our sunset safari because I think there is going to be some action. Indeed. But for this morning, I don't think too much more is going to happen with these lines. I think they are just going to enjoy a good old rest. Mm. 
Rishan, that's a very good question. Um, this is more the Telemati breakaway um, pride's territory. I don't think they're going to move away. This is their territory, you know, and, um, you know, those two females with their five youngsters and plus a little cub, if that little cub is still around, I mean, they'll come down here. This is their area. This is their territory. So they should come down very soon. I mean, the, the buffaloes are here unless... Unless that pride, the Talamati breakaways, unless they are, are sitting with a buffalo kill inside Biffleshook, that's a uh, property that's just north of Juma, unless they're sitting with a, a kill that side, um, you know, they're going to be feeding on there for like the next two, three days. Or they might even be on the property. So we didn't really take a look further northwest of uh, Juma to see if any lion tracks have come down from that side. It, it is going to be very interesting. If that pride bumps into the Timbali pride, it's going to be quite an interesting encounter, especially that the S8 male, that's the dominant male of this area, male line of this area, he's got three young females and the young, uh, two young males of the Mbali pride, that's his offspring. And on top of that, the Telemati breakaways, he's got those five youngsters and the young, and then that one young cub. That's his offspring. Which way he's going to turn, he's, I don't know, because I don't, I've never seen him with this pride. I don't know, I don't know his relation, uh, relationship with his females. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as I say, nature's, nature's very interesting. You know, nature we have to, that's like with me, like being 17 years yeah, in the Greater Kruger Park, I always enjoy the practical side of things. I always enjoy watching how the things play out because what you read and what you experience is two different things many a time. That's why I rather like to see if that does happen. I rather like to take a look when that encounter happens on the dynamics of that S8 male. What does he do? What does he do? Is he protecting the Telemati breakaways youngsters? Does he protect the Mbali pride, which we're currently sitting with, their youngsters, you know? So, yeah, as I say, that's, that's, that's uh, those moments we always kind of wait for. And that's why we follow them. That's why we follow them. That's why we try and keep up with them. So we can also understand the dynamics much, much clearer and much more understanding. Kerry, it is. It's a soap opera of the bush. That's um, that's what makes it so fascinating. I like a lot of. I know a lot of guides, and that they'll say, "Oh, it's just a pride of lions. Oh, it's just a le female leopard. Oh, it's just a male leopard." Yes, it is, for sure. I agree with that. But at the end of the day, we like to know. Well, this is the Mbali pride. Okay, now the Mbali pride is moving from A to B to C to D because of this reason. Now, because we know it's in Bali Pride. If you do not know it's in Bali Pride, you're just going to say Pride of Lions, and oh, that Pride of Lions coming here. Then you, all of a sudden you're not understanding the dynamics of what Pride, in Bali Pride, or the Telemati Breakaway Pride. Then you're not understanding that, okay, well, they are coming into this area because of this reason. This one is moving out of this area because of that reason. You're not, you know, then you won't understand those things. So that's why for us it is also a, pretty much a soap opera. It's an understanding of the dynamics of this family, of this pride, on why and how and who. And that's always very important. That's why with Wild Earth, it's, it is a, it's amazing to really keep up with it. Because for me, even for my parents, for my friends, for everybody that watch, watches Wild Earth, we can keep up on the the movements of these families of these prides of these individual leopards and we can understand where they go and why they go there so yes very very important and for me that keeps me on my toes <laughs> trust me it keeps me on my toes because all of a sudden it's like i like to know where's this pride going to why are they here 
why isn't the telemati breakaways here? <laughs> it's always nice to know those things. And um, I mean, for many years, I've been keeping up, up uh, keeping up with uh, the the leopard dynamics, the lion dynamics in these areas. And I would, and I won't stop. It's in my nature. I won't stop. It's just the way I am, and I love it. And I love for everybody to enjoy what we enjoy. But isn't he a beautiful male? No, Bradley, it does. It kind of becomes very addictive. And as I said, nobody, nobody will tell me not to enjoy these individuals and name these individuals. No, because to me, for many a year, I've followed these individuals, followed these prides, and to me, it is a story. And a story is important to the wild for us to uh, enjoy. So yeah, Bradley, it is active. And I've never been like that with hyenas, funny enough, never. Until I started with, uh, started with Wild Earth and started to realize with all these individual hyenas and who's a matriarch, who's coming in, who's going out, who's the cub, which cub belongs to who. And how far does this cub go? And you know, so yeah, it, it becomes a beautiful story. And like even for myself, thinking about leopards. I mean, I've followed these leopards here in the, in the northern Sabi Sands uh, since I started here in 2010. And when I started here in 2010 in the northern Sabi Sands, it just, uh, from, then, from then on, it just became quite fascinating to follow these individuals, follow the lineage. I mean, if you're looking at the leopard side of things with Safari and her daughter, Karula, and her daughters, Shadow and uh, Tandi. And now they've got Maripsia and Kishava. So it's just, it just continues. And for me, it's amazing how that gene pool remains in the Sabi Sands for such a long time. For such a long time. And it just shows you that when it comes to female leopards, they do not really venture too far. They remain in the area. And just for that gene pool just to continue, to continue, to continue. But lions is a little bit different. Lion dynamics, I mean, you look at the Styx Pride. I mean, the Styx Pride, I was so used to the Styx Pride being in the northern Sabi Sands for such a long time. It's one of the oldest prides, actually, um, in the entire Sabi Sands, uh, the Styx Pride. And they used to be, yeah, and then uh, all of a sudden they disappeared and they went south. And now they're at Sabi Sabi. Beautiful pride, the Styx Pride. Beautiful pride. But they will never come back into the northern sands because I think the pressure from other prides are t it's too too heavy. So you're looking at like the Nkumas, you're looking at now, yeah, in Bali pride, the Talamati breakaways, the Talamati pride. It's too much pressure. So why remain here yeah, if they've got a beautiful void in the southern side of the Sabi sands? Well, if there was a female leopard that's crossed into Juma close to central off Cheetah Cut Line, I don't know where it is. We haven't been able to find a single track. Strangely, uh, the next road north from there, I did find tracks of a male leopard coming in, unless those who saw it were mistaken. So I'm just checking up, which is going up this road, which is going to take me up to Buffalsook Dam. Uh, and then after that, I guess we will try again this afternoon. But. My current morning's revelation is that tracking leopards 
It's a bit like golf. It's really difficult. We're rubbish 95% of the time, but just every now and again you catch one off the screws and you suddenly think that you're quite good at golf all of a sudden and it gives you enough excitement and impetus to come back and have another crack another time. But uh, I think that's the way, that's where I am with leopards at the moment. We like to think that we're better than we are, but we don't get it right very often. <laughs> We, Ernie and I were laughing about it earlier. We've seen two leopards. We've spent, we've spent so long looking at tracks and following tracks. The two leopards that we have seen over the last week, we've driven around the corner and they've just been in the road. So we didn't have to work through them at all. But it's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes and that's the fun part is the looking. It's also immensely frustrating. Um, but I always say if it was easy, it would be boring. Well, yeah, I think they always have been, but sometimes we're fortunate and they pop out on the road in front of us. Uh, but they are the ultimate masters of camouflage, and so we always say a leopard will be seen if it wants to be seen. If it doesn't want to be seen, you'll drive straight past it and never know it was there. I'm sure we've driven past a couple this morning that have seen us, uh, and I'm sure that is always the way. But it never gets old and never gets boring, that's for sure. And still the excitement value, even when you're in a place like this where we do see leopard with alarming regularity if you compare it to most other game reserves or areas of the country. Uh, right, sounds like we're going to quickly send you over to Chris. All right, there we go. <laughs> there we go, guys. <laughs> Didn't I say we're going to try and find some lions this morning? Okay, we might think this is Lagatha, and that could very well be. But the report I got that there are two lions here, and there were some hyenas that were harassing them, which prompted this lioness to move up into this marula tree. The other other lioness calling. But this is a sub adult. This is not Lagatha. You can see it is moving. It's communicating now with the other lion. Yeah, well, this is, I don't think this is Lagatha, in spite of climbing a tree at this small case of young lioness, sub adult, problem with hyenas, best escape, get up into a tree. Yeah, well, thanks to Morris who found these lions, and uh, Morris is not with us to do today. He's actually guiding some guests for eco-training. Vicky, yes indeed. Clearly not as graceful as a leopard. So while lions can climb trees, they're not nearly as skilled. They're not nearly as skilled as leopards at climbing, especially when comes to descending from those trees. It's another line just to the left yeah, that I just heard. It might be the other lioness that uh, Morris and Tutukoni spotted. We could hear her there. You hear that soft grunt? Er I think we got a visual, we can see it, yes. Okay, so for those who are new to our show, these lions are part of our resident pride, and we call them the Ngati pride. And the word Ngati is the local name for blood. And prior to this being proclaimed a conservancy, these lions were heavily prosecuted. Itsy, Catman, strike again, lion in a tree, indeed. Just going back to these prides. Yeah, so these, these lions were persecuted heavily, sometimes illegally in this particular region. 
And since the current ownership of Pridelands took over here, and this became a protected area, these lions were called Mingati Pride, the blood lions. Kind of like symbolizing how now lions are protected in this region and this pride cannot be persecuted anymore by humans. Okay, we're going to have to stick with them and see what's, what's, what's happening. There's, there's, there's another lion that growled now there. So let's go and take a look. Because they're obviously going to be quite wary of the hyena still, which I have not seen yet. See, Tukani and Morris is up ahead, so they looks like they might still see those lions. Oh, there's the lion there. Two lions. I can see two lions. There are two lions there. We're going on to a, a termite mount. And we'll just give Tutukani time to move around, after which we will follow. Okay, let's move a bit forward. Whoa! First morning, we've got some lions. Delighted, absolutely delighted. Now they're gonna go lie down. So it's gonna quickly stop here and we're gonna frame up. Uh, we had a question there and I unfortunately didn't get all that. So I'm gonna ask our mission control to just repeat that question for me. Right at that moment where I ignited the vehicle. Burmese lion, where does the name Pridelands come from? Um, Burmese lion, so the original name of this property is the original farm name was named Amsterdam. All right, so that's actually the property's registered name. But since the current ownership took over here, yeah, a couple of years ago, it was renamed to Pridelands. And that links to the Ngati Pride strongly. And the current ownership, one of the big things that they stand for is the protection of biodiversity. And Pridelands was bought specifically with that in mind. Incorporated it eventually, subsequently, into the Greater Kruger giving it the highest protection status that you can get. And it was named Pridelands in order to kind of like make a stand and say, you know what, these lions were heavily persecuted illegally at times by humans in the, in the region. And now became a safe haven for the Ngati Pride more specifically. So it is a name that they generated, that the ownership felt was quite relevant to the history of the area where these cats were heavily persecuted. And Pridelands now, typical example of an area that has been turned from farmlands back to its original state and where wild animals can roam protected and free and not having to worry about humans interfering. They are constantly calling so I think they are trying to communicate with the remainder of the pride or the rest of the pride. It is a young male and a young female.
Good morning, Chase. Um, they do look okay. They do look healthy-ish for now. But they're both young lions. And this young male, he's, um, if you look at his posture, he's, it's a very dominant type of pose. And he was growling at the young female. But it is a sub-adult lion. It's not one of the two new males that's entered the area. He's getting a big body. Those males have caused some disruptions in the pride dynamics. Not unnatural disruptions, just disruptions. And that's something you often will see when males, new males enter an area. It is often the case. Especially these youngsters, a lot of the young males will need to move away. They won't be tolerated by any new arriving males. The sub-adult lionesses, all depending on their age. If they are above a certain age, they will tolerate them because they can mate with them. If not, they don't have the luxury to, of time to wait. So very, very young sub-adult lionesses will also be treated the same. They'll have to move away. That's just how lions work. Thanks to our wonderful Wild Earth Explorers, Wild Earth Kids is back. Your monthly subscriptions have allowed us to relaunch Wild Earth schools on a weekly basis, every Wednesday for the first hour of the Sunset Safari. You guys bring a smile to my face every single day. Sign your class up for a special virtual field trip to Africa, because touching the lives of the future protectors of our Earth truly matters. Well, I can tell you one thing. I was really hoping to get some lions. I didn't know how we we're going to find them. Managed, even though it's towards the very late stages of this morning safari. Better late than never, I suppose. And they seem to have now calmed down. The hyenas have moved away. And unfortunately, we didn't get to see those hyenas. 
still casting a watchful eye in that direction, the two lions. Now they seem to have found a nice little lying up spot where they're going to very likely spend the remainder of the day or at least of the morning. They've got an elevated area. It's a very old termite mount, inactive termite mount, covered in grass, so it's comfortable. They've got a bit of a breeze going and there's shade. So this would be considered a good spot. And Jerome, spot on there, it was a lion and elephant day. The nice thing is now that we know exactly where they are, we can in fact revisit them this afternoon if they are still around. If not, at least then we've got a starting point from where to track them down. So it will increase our chance to see lion again this afternoon. But it's never a guarantee. They might move into a very thick area which we cannot penetrate with these vehicles. It can happen, in fact. But we'll see how it goes. And the only thing we can do is wait until this afternoon, come back to the area. I'll take a GPS reading to make sure I've got the exact, exact location right down to the point. And that's not necessarily for me, that's in case somebody else this afternoon beats a steward and wants to come and see if they can't find these lines again. And they have a GPS coordinate that they can follow. Well, that was a great morning, especially down here at Pride Limbs, lots of elephants. Things happening all over the life safari. So this afternoon, our plan again is going to be to try and come back to these lions. We are basically at the end of the show and it was great to host you on this live safari. Let's do take another last look at these two lions. And remember this afternoon we are heading out again on the sunset safari. And that will start at about 2.30 Central African time. 2.30 Central African time is when we will start and hopefully we can continue where we've left off just now. So until then everybody, goodbye, stay safe. We'll see you again this afternoon for another live safari into the African wild. couldn't have come at a better time. We've got a mother cheetah, she's running into this herd of topi, wildebeest and zebra. And who knows, maybe she's spotted a youngster that she thinks she can single out, it seems like she may have. Hello and welcome everybody to Live at the Waterhole. I'm so excited to have you on board. It's such a new experience for all of us and we're looking exactly at a new cam. It's Jamala at Madikwe Game Reserve. And I'm going to be guiding you through the experience. It's me, Trishala. I hope that you're happy to hear this familiar voice again. I'm certainly happy to be your guide and your naturalist for the next three hours together. So like I said, it's live and interactive and it's new. 
And you can send us your questions and your comments as usual by heading over to our website and registering. And the pace of this show is quite slow. So I think of it as uh, me being your air hostess and you're on the airplane. So when you send through your questions and your comments, I'm there ready to interact and answer them. But you may also just want to use this time to sit back and enjoy a slice of nature from around the various areas here in Southern Africa and take in the wonderful si sounds and sights. Now we are at Jamala, which is in Medikwe. And like I said, this is a new spot for us, particularly in terms of cams. So Medikwe Game Reserve is situated in the northwest province of South Africa, quite close to the Botswana border. And we can see a whole range of animals in this area. Of course, it hosts the big five, a term that is a hunting term, of course. But it's still a popular word to, or popular